Hello, I'm Nate Regeer, founder and CEO of Next Element, a global consulting and training firm helping organizations transform their cultures with compassionate accountability. Thanks for joining me on the Compassionate Accountability Podcast, where we get to meet amazing people who are bringing more compassion to the world. I hope you'll find something useful in this episode. And if you like what you hear, please subscribe, rate, and review to help us reach more listeners. Be sure to visit our website at next-element.com, where you can learn more about our work and check out all of our previous episodes. I love it when one of my guests refers someone they know, because it's almost always a good fit for my podcast. I was introduced to Caverly Morgan by Kristen Neff, one of the most influential self-compassion researchers and practitioners, and a previous guest on my show. And after our conversation, Kristen said I had to meet Caverly. So here we are. Caverly Morgan is a spiritual teacher, a nonprofit founder, speaker, and author who brings the original spirit of Zen to addressing current problems in our world. Her practice began in 1995, when she in, which has included eight years of training in a silent Zen monastery. Can't wait to hear a little bit about that. Since 2001, Caverly has been teaching contemplative practice to clients around the world. She is the founder of Peace in Schools, a nonprofit that created the nation's first four-credit mindfulness class in public high schools. Caverly is passionate about creating opportunities for people to experience compassion in community and connection. I love this. It's so aligned with my belief that transformation happens in the interaction. Caverly is the author of two books and has been featured in various publications, and I'm delighted to welcome her to my show to explore how she's manifesting compassion and accountability in the world. So Caverly, welcome to the Compassion Accountability Podcast. Thank you so much, Nate. I, it's a real honor to be here. And as you said, when I checked out what you were doing, I was so delighted to see how much overlap there is. Um, just shared shared passion, vision, um, enthusiasm. I know. it's It's been great. And the more I learn about your work, the more I see that overlap. And I wonder, um, you know, before we dive into kind of what you're doing these days, I always love to hear a bit about the journey of my guests. And because so much of those formative influences are part of your story. And, and I'm curious if you'd be willing to share a few highlights about what was along your path getting to here. Absolutely. You know, I think the highlight is that I grew up uh, without a lot of excess suffering. I was always, I grew up in a family where there was enough privilege, um, sort of societal privilege, as well as just the privilege of my my um, specific context that I never wondered where my next meal was coming from. You know, I didn't, I can't say I was someone who suffered a lot. Uh, and I put that in quotes because I think a lot of what was going on as I was growing up is I didn't recognize the internal suffering uh, that I later in life, after my first Zen meditation retreat, was able to see um, that I was able to see that something was going on that was optional that I had just assumed was how life worked. And it had to do with um, my relationship to myself, others, and the world, but in a more internalized fashion. Wow. So that led to monastic training, which led to a real deep dive into, is it possible to not suffer? Is it possible to, of course, we're going to have pain in life, but is it possible to move through life either without suffering or with less suffering? Right. I, I was open. I was open to whatever the uh, increment, uh, incremental uh, route might be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, we've already heard a couple words thrown around: compassion, suffering, contemplative, meditation. These are big words, and I know that compassion is a foundational theme for you. And obviously that's one of the main connections between us. But as you know, and as my listeners know, I'm a stickler for working definitions. You know, with my background in behavioral science, I believe that we need kind of shared mental models for the things that we're trying to work on and build. So how do you define compassion? Mm, thank you so much. And I love that I wasn't given this 
question ahead of time because it lets me see what's true about compassion in this moment without just referring to something wrote. And in this moment, what's true about compassion is that compassion's a byproduct of knowing that we are connected. So when I when I know our interconnection, for example, when I know that I'm not separate from you, Nate, compassion naturally is there. And I do think it's valuable to underline this because sometimes compassion is um, defined as something we have to strive for or, or go and get. But but my experience of compassion is that it's it's a way to speak about the love that is there when I recognize our our interconnection. Mm. Mm-hmm. I know course, there's oh yes, please. No, no, go ahead. I was just gonna acknowledge that of course there is this the standard definition that it's um to 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 suffer with, to be with, to have to have a type of em- empathy that is 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 truly based on interconnection. Um, but I just as we define it, I like to I'd like to take this opportunity to underline that it's that it's something innate and that it's a byproduct product of of a deep recognition. Mm. So a you're you're describing it as kind of like it, it's it emerges from the understanding, the recognition, the embracing that we are connected. Yes. It's my so, experience. Yeah. yeah. Well, you, if in, in this understanding, if, if it's not, if it's more of a byproduct of recognizing our connection and it's not necessarily something we build and strive for and try to create, or you've mentioned that it's not something that we have to get right um, or something that we do. Will you say a little bit more about kind of this emergent quality of of experience or of compassion is kind of an experience. Yes. Nate, the thing that keeps arising for me to touch on is, uh, you know, I know from our exchanges before this opportunity for a face-to-face um, that you're a very dedicated and committed father. Um, and mm. that it, it occurs to me that um, you might imagine, or you might, I'll ask you if if you feel that you have to do something in order to find compassion for. Do you have one um, child or more than one? I have three daughters. Three, three daughters. daughters. Who yes. I spent lots of time with recently. So this is a very relevant question. I feel you're going to be asking. <laughs> yeah, I'm just curious if you have to um, if you have to do something in order to find that experience of compassion for your three daughters. No, actually, it's it's just the opposite. It's really when we just are that we're just being together, uh, maybe without expectations, without an agenda, without um, any of that, that it probably emerges the most or I experience it the most. It, it, that's how it is for me, too. And 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 so what interests me at this point in my work is supporting people in recognizing who they are so that they have the opportunity to be flooded with this very natural experience of of love and and compassion. Well, so you've touched on you've touched on your work and how does this how does this what you're describing relate to the work that you're doing now? Will you describe that? My work revolves around supporting people and knowing the heart of who they are. Just to, I and I recognize, you know, here I am. I'm doing the the right marketing thing of referencing my own book title in a in a podcast. But you know, I do love that title. I love that I got to choose that title because, in a way, I feel all the I feel that all my work revolves around this notion of what does it mean to recognize and remember the heart of who we truly are? And by that, I, I mean that for so many of us, we, we get a little confused about who we truly are. We, 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 our identities get wrapped up with, with what we do or whether we're successful at what we do or our role as a father or our um, role as a daughter. 
you know, there's so many different hats that we're all habituated, conditioned, and sometimes really appropriately so, sometimes with conscious choice to wear. Mm -hmm. And so what interests me is who are we underneath all of those identities, underneath all of those labels? Who are we that is the same who we are that was true when we were five or 10 or 15 or now? And in my experience, when we touch this, when we know this, that's when it's, it's again, very accessible to know love, to know happiness, joy, the peace of our own being. Mm. Uh, and compassion tends to radiate from, from that knowing. And, and that's, my work is to support people in knowing this experience in touching this in being able to live this and as you know and and one of the things we connect over then to bring that into our workspaces or in my case i i do support organizations businesses with these um, practices and contemplative technologies and as you've mentioned i also support educators and and school systems because what an important place to remember the heart of who we are, you know, mm. in in school, when working with young people. When you're when you're working with people around this, are there some common walls or barriers that people face? And what's on the other side? Thank you very much. That's such a good question. You know, um, as you mentioned, I you we know each other through Dr. Kristen Neff's work. We she and I just led a retreat together, and one of the things she's famous for underlining is that we are deeply habituated to believe that if we had self compassion, we'd lose motivation. And uh, in that same way, I find that many people believe that if they spent time or resources, energy, exploring the inquiry of who am I truly, that it would actually derail them from the work of their life, from, you know, being the person they want to be in the world, from achieving uh, high standards at work. Of course, just like Kristen's Neff, Kristen Neff's research shows, the opposite is actually true. But it doesn't it doesn't feel that way when we're caught in this deep belief system that we we need to strive in order to keep up. Mm. Yeah, I, I I recall Dr. Neff talking about that, and and there's something in there that has stuck with me. There mm -hmm. there seems to be a bit of a paradox that. When we see ourselves as human doings, <laughs> that our identity is really wrapped up in all these achievements and everything, then it's really always about striving. It's really about getting to that next thing, which seems a little bit opposite from the sense of, of, of contentedness or, or, or being that goes with kind of self-compassion. And at the same time, the paradox is this belief that you just mentioned that if we if we are at peace, then somehow we're not motivated. Like we need to be somehow uncomfortable or striving to be able to be working towards something. And you're saying that, no, th these things can both exist. In, in fact, um, Nate, your next interview perhaps should be with my husband. That would be just comedy, Co comedic relief for your listeners, because, you know, he's now been with me long enough to see that it's when I'm I'm most grounded in who I am, that creative juices flow, passion for where to move next with what's possible, specifically regarding um, collective change, collective transformation, mm. that, that energy comes from presence. It comes mm. from compassion for self and other that again, we experience as we rest deeply and fully in presence. And that's why what interests me is how to support others in resting in the presence that actually leads to the very things that we're told by society, culture, the conditioned mind 
we have to achieve external things in order to experience. We have to um, we have to look outside ourselves for those those measurements. In in truth, those those measurements naturally occur as we're moving through the world from this recognition of of the heart of who we are. In my experience. I'd love to, I would love to hear some more about how this works in, in groups. And, and I mentioned in the, in the introduction about, I'm just so aligned with this idea of this, of, of the collective that we discover this within relationships. Before we get there though, you, you, you tapped into something I want, I want to come back to. I understand you're not a fan of Mm self-improvement and I'm kind of struck by that. So will you say more about that? Absolutely. I, it's true. I have a lot of questions about our current societal model of self-improvement and what that tends to, what the byproduct of striving for self-improvement is. And Mm -hmm. so for most of us, self-improvement actually keeps a small and limited sense of an individual self in place, you know? So how many of us have sort of set kind of a goal or here we are in January, uh, set a, a New Year's resolution? Maybe we meet it, but how long do we get to hang out in in the success of that before we're, we're striving again? For most of us, we actually, we don't meet it and we end up um, constantly in that rat wheel, wheel of trying to improve ourselves. So the the thing that doesn't work about self-improvement to me is, and that I think often doesn't get questioned, is that in a model of self-improvement, there's always a sense of separate self to improve. So it reaffirms a sense of separateness rather than, you know, some people think that, oh, okay, well, so then that's suggesting if I were to live a life where I'm resting in presence all the time, you know, there wouldn't, I I wouldn't have, I'd lose my uniqueness or my personality, or I wouldn't, I would just be some kind of blah being. Um, and, and that's not true at all. Again, in my experience, it's, it's when we're resting in presence that the, the personality gets used in service of a greater love, a greater compassion. And that from that service, we tend to be deeply engaged in life. And then ironically enough, people around us tend to say, gosh, you sure are a lot more pleasant to be around than than you were when you were in that small, limited, stuck in the sense of separate self. You know, you're not Mm. defending yourself in the same ways. You're not fighting. You're not fighting life in the same ways. You're you're not angry. Mm. Untethered. Mm -hmm. You're untethered. Mm. You're yeah. untethered and, and, and freedom is contagious. Mm. Mm-hmm. So how do you do this? How does this collective practice work? Will you give us some examples of, sure. of, this, of this? Yeah. What I love about collective practice is that for many people, especially those who take on a mindfulness practice, Practice is something we do by ourselves. We sort of work on ourselves. We we do these practices. We become um, more, more responsive, less reactive. All those things are great things. But then we struggle once we hit our workplace. It, then we struggle once we're in relationship, especially uh, the reason I like workplaces or school systems is because we're we're being asked by life to work things out with folks we didn't choose to necessarily Mm. be in relationship with. Like here we are, we're all working for the same school administration and we have different political beliefs. We have different conditioning. We have different ways we've learned to survive in the world. So what's interesting to me is to have shared practices that allow a group to move into a more transformed relationship with themselves, you know, each other and the work environment because there's been a a shared movement. So that might look like unpacking some conditioned assumptions and beliefs in the workplace. You know, if I'm if I'm in a workplace um, let's say an educational setting. This is this is an actual example. 
let's say in my educational setting, there is a deep belief that if I don't overwork, it will be assumed I don't care as an educator. So for example, right. if I'm if I've if I've got a, a meditation retreat coming up, I, I can't call, I can't put that on my shared calendar at work because people will assume I'm woo-woo or don't care or not working hard. And so I have to call it a training. I have to say I'm I'm on a training right. and then hope that no one finds out there was meditation or contemplative technologies offered, right? So what happens when we unpack shared beliefs and assumptions, get to the root of them, and then create change with, with tools. We create change mm -hmm. that, that, that really not only creates personal transformation, but collective shifting because there are new collective guidelines that more accu accurately reflect the heart of who we are. Mm. Like shared guidelines that reflect the heart of who we are. Are you talking about shared guidelines like new commitments to how we're going to be with each other? Yes. Yes. And those new commitments can only be transformational, truly fresh and alive if we've unpacked, as you said, like what's been getting in the way. What are the blocks mm -hmm. that arise in this work environment that usually don't get questioned? Right. That right. usually are just the the water we're swimming in. So the the step one, as as you know, I I um I do a I do some work that I've titled real the path of realizing freedom together, and in this pathway, one of the one of the processes is is seeing what binds us, but then dismantling, right? Really unpacking. Mm. Did we just inherit these shared beliefs? Mm. Are they? Are we consciously choosing them as a as a workplace or as a as a school? Mm. One of the the things that we bump up against and can't ignore in these scenarios is the reality of conflict and yes. and the reality of when people come together as I think we're meant to be, we now introduce a lot more static in the system because we're bringing beautiful individuality or beautiful uniqueness, um, different ways of seeing the world, different passions. We're bringing it together and celebrating it is one thing and allowing it is one thing. However, uh, I just, I just can't help but believe that the conflict is inherent and purposeful because of how we're special. So how do we reconcile this, how do we reconcile the, the energy of conflict in these situations? Well, I think, Nate, I think you're doing it through your share, which is touching to me. You know, where you're, you're in, in your sh sharing, there's an inherent recognition that conflict's inevitable and that it doesn't have to be seen as a bad thing. So, um, I, because are are you actually married at the, at the moment, or do you have I a am, yes. life partner? So you might have the same experience I do, where you're able to recognize it would be foolish to think that you could be in a life partnership and never have any conflict arise. It, am I right, or do you have the oh, perfect absolutely. marriage? I would, do you have I would, the perfect marriage that uh, some people are? Well, I, I think if there was no conflict, it would not be a very good marriage. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So many of us are conditioned or habituated to um, see conflict as, as something worth avoiding, as something that won't actually lead us to deeper connection. And I, I believe the same thing is true, you know, in a workplace that we that we that that step one is to recognize the the importance of shedding all of these limiting beliefs we have around what conflict even is. Mm. What if what comes after? Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Well, what if in a, in in let's say I'm in a workplace. What if in my workplace every time conflict arose, I saw it as a chance to, um, to have more authentic relationship with the people that I work with, deeper connection and and shared vision, mission, deeper deeper sense of shared purpose, and then capacity to be more efficient in our shared purpose. Uh, with you hundred percent.
And then that leads to, so how do we do that? Mm-hmm. You know, in my experience, we, we're, I'll, I'll start with how, how, how to not do it. You know, we, so many workplaces, so many settings that say they'd like to have a more compassionate work environment or compassionate school, um, aren't examining, as you said, like what blocks it, what's, what gets in the way. So I think there has to be a shared examination of, of, of what can, can block the knowing of who we are together. And then in my experience, there are contemplative technologies and tools that when applied collectively, transform an environment. So really what my short answer with with uh, now following what what doesn't work, um, yeah. how the tools do is practice, a, a practice of seeing, a practice of being awake together, a practice of um, shared letting go of what tends to get in the way of our our inherent freedom, personally and then in relationship, knowing each other, working together. Mm. Mm. And most workplaces are sort of allergic to the notion of shared practice. You know, we focus well, so absolutely. much. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. We, we are both in the, in the business of a p- application that we're, these are things we do with each other. It's, it's not just something nice to have this really, it has to get down to the nitty gritty daily conversations, the real problems we're solving, how we reconcile our goals um, I, I'm, I'm so with you that we need, we, we need tangible practices, things that, that are our rituals and routines for how we do this, um, so that we can, um, uh, steward that energy in, in yes. a positive way. Um, you're doing some neat stuff with schools. And mm-hmm. I was so fascinated by what you shared in a, in a previous conversation about an actual four credit class for high school students to learn some of these mm-hmm. things. Will you share just a little bit about that? Absolutely. Yeah, I'm the founder of of Peace in Schools. And I, after 10 years of working with this program and watching it flourish, um, we're now in an expansion um, stage of our work where we've created a pilot program in which we train educators directly. When I started the nonprofit, we were training contemplatives to bring these tools, these contemplative technologies that I also bring into retreat settings. I also bring into online classes, bring into workplaces, as you're hearing, educational settings at large. We bring these tools into classrooms. And over these uh, 10 years, as these mindfulness instructors have been sharing these tools, we've seen tremendous personal and collective transformation. And so, Now we're in the process of of flipping this model so that we can really scale what we know has worked. Mm. What are some of the, do you, do you have like just an example, a person or a relationship or something that stands out for you that you could share to give us, um, give us a human, a human sure. connection to this? Absolutely. I mean, this is just the first one that came to mind. So I'll share it. You know, there are lots of stories about teens who will say this class saved my life. But the just in relationship to what we've been talking about and the work I do in workplaces and um, educational settings at large, it was very touching to me when a student of mine and and by the way, I have lots of stories in the book, The Heart of Who We Are, for anyone interested. Um, But one thing that comes to mind to share with you today is that there was a student who had been kind of known for not communicating very well. The parents were struggling. They couldn't get a sense of like how to support their teen and what was going on. I'm sure a lot of people listening can relate to a to a, having a teenager who struggles with communication. Yeah. Um, and so this teen was, the mother was upstairs and she was starting to come down the stairs and she paused on the stairwell because she overheard her her teen who had been struggling with communication reflectively listening his sister and so the sister was talking about her experience and he was listening and then he was reflecting her own words back to her and he was in this conscious compassionate communication dialogue with his sister and it a a, a place where there had been a lot of conflict 
She heard it completely dissipate, dissolve, and actually end in an embrace and some sh shed tears of love and connection. So it's mm. just a little moment of something very concrete that this young person was offered and then implemented in his own right. Didn't just implement because we were practicing conscious, compassionate communication in the classroom, you know, implemented it in a moment where he knew he was struggling and he mm. wanted to, he wanted to, to access compassion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. What a great example of, of, of things we can be doing to help deal with this epidemic of people not feeling seen yeah. and not seeing each other and just simple practices that can connect us in that way. What a beautiful story. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there's so many, so many things you shared. I'd love to just go deep into each one of these Please. and and we don't, we don't have the time to do it, but I am, I would love to know what these days, these days, where are you finding joy and fulfillment? What is, mm. what is percolating for you or uh, come bringing light for you? Well, in this moment, I will acknowledge one thing that is bringing tremendous joy is that uh, Maggie Steele, who works for Peace in Schools, and I just led an educator retreat. And it was the first retreat of this cohort where we are um, training these teachers uh, to, uh, to be able to be certified in implementing our semester-long curriculum curriculum. So that was just joyous for me. It was so fulfilling. And then the the other thing that came up, Nate, was I uh, lead a lot of retreats, uh, just led a retreat with Krista Neff at the Whitby Institute. And that was really a rich connection. I'm going to be doing more work with Dr. Krista Neff. Mm -hmm. uh, we're exploring the question, who is the self in self-compassion? And that's a really rich topic. And I, and that was at the Whidbey Institute. And, and I, one thing that's bringing joy is that collaboration and also living on Whidbey Island. My husband mm. and I just moved here pretty recently and it's, it's a stunning place to live. Beautiful. That's a, let's see, is that, that's near Seattle, right? In the, you in take the a Northwest. ferry from, take mm -hmm. a ferry from Seattle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so I, I did my internship for my doctorate in Tacoma at the VA Medical Center and just have just have such a love for the Northwest. And we, one of my close friends and mentors lives on Vashon Island. Oh, yes. And yes. Um, similar landscape. Time. Yeah. Beautiful, mm -hmm. beautiful, wonderful. You know, Kaverly, I just I just want to see and affirm you. You have such an amazing um, breadth of dimensions from from spending the time in contemplative practice, your own, your own, um, your own self-work to be able to translate that into a book, translate or into books, into programs, into ways to teach it, into being able to certify people. I think this is something that a lot of people don't appreciate in what it takes to make a difference and make change in the world. It's not just having and being or having a good idea or having a point of view, it's being able to translate it into ways that can be taught and replicated and practiced and measured. And um, you're just congratulations. And, and I just want to affirm that it's really important um, that you provide vehicles. And so these workshops, the different things you're doing is bringing these things to so many more people. Well, I really appreciate very much um, that acknowledgement, and I'm I'm in agreement with you that um, sometimes we don't recognize that it it all has to come together in order for something to be able to scale. And the thing I appreciate most is I don't feel I don't take sort of personal credit for <laughs> what you're speaking about. I really I feel that. I feel a deep call to be of service. And the thing that matters most to me to communicate with you and your listeners about this is there that there is a, that this all can be learned. That that I I feel like I've had some incredible mentors and coaches that that supported me in being able to have my life be a reflection of my deepest understanding and knowing and and, and that that can be taught to me is just really great news. 
it is great news that we can mm-hmm. learn it and we can teach mm-hmm. it. And of course there's catalysts and mentors and there's so many people and situations that come together for these things to work. Mm-hmm. So if people wanted to get a hold of you or learn more about the various things you've mentioned, we're going to put these lots of links in the show notes. Is there uh, what should people do if they want to learn more? Well, thanks, Nate. If if uh, folks just want to learn about me or the children's book I wrote called A Kid's Book About Mindfulness or my adult book, um, The Heart of Who We Are, Realizing Freedom Together, my website is um, caverlymorgan.org. There are not a lot of caverlies. I have my mom to thank for that. Yeah. Um, and then uh, realizingfreedomtogether.com. Uh, is where uh, a lot of my business work is expanding, working with, um, you know, as a consultant, supporting workplaces and uh, institutions, educational institutions. So um, thanks for the opportunity to mention that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And thank you for who you are, for what you bring and for joining me today on this episode of of the Compassionate Accountability Podcast. It's been a delight. Thank you so much, Nate. Thanks for joining me, everyone. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Compassionate Accountability Podcast. What struck you? What can you take and use today? I'd love to hear from you. And if you haven't already, pick up a copy of my new book, Compassionate Accountability, How Leaders Build Connection and Get Results. If you've already read the book, I'd appreciate your review on Amazon. Contact us today to learn more about how Next Element helps companies transform their cultures with compassionate accountability. And remember, embracing both compassion and accountability is the secret to great leadership and the roadmap for thriving cultures and strong brands.